Thank you everybody for joining us today. And we are socially distanced, I can see that. Is this really happening? Are we really back together in person? We are, thank thankfully. As is customary and very appropriate, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. Fellow Rotarians and guests, thank you for joining us today for what is our first time back together since March. I'm sorry, please have a seat. <laughs> Thank you, and I mean thank you for sticking with us during this uncertain time, knowing that this club was pursuing initiatives that are important to the future of Sioux Falls and wider area. But before we get started with today's exciting program with our distinguished governor, Christy Nome, I'd like to provide a brief update of all that has gone on with your Rotary Club of downtown Sioux Falls. But first, I wanna personally take a moment and extend some appreciation and thanks to a few important people. I wanna start by thanking Executive Director Angie Kuyper for her enthusiasm and attention to detail as we adjusted over the past few months. And now again, we get back together in person. I would also like to thank our board for their support and encouragement as we pivoted over the past few months. Finally, and I know I speak for many others, I wanna thank Rotarians Eric Elfson with ClickRain and Bonnie Harari at Think3D for the use of their studios and endless coordination calls as we brought programming to the club and wider community since we had to move into a remote environment. It is not a surprise to anyone here, but the last few months have been extraordinary. I recall well a conversation with Jesse Schmidt, our past president, in early March when we were facing the prospect of not meeting again for a while and how we were going to manage through it. While we knew that we were going to, while we knew we were going to manage through it, we knew that we had to put the mentoring program initiative on hold for a bit, and we decided that it was imperative that we zero in on our programming, raise the bar, and use our digital channels to communicate with both Rotarians and the community at large. We didn't just bring normal programs. We brought conversations that were relevant and timely, but as importantly, we brought difficult subjects in the form of conversations that were both thoughtful and civil. We are all well aware that there is no shortage of noise and loud opinions in the world, but there is a shortage of thoughtful and civil dialogue. And we thought that it was high time that someone stepped up to show that there is still a market for that type of engagement, a type of engagement that we know well here in South Dakota. It turned out we were right. Since April, our programs have been viewed over 175,000 times on five continents. And one thing is for sure, our programming will remain elevated and you won't be disappointed in what we have lined up for the next couple months beginning today. And that's not it. 
we brought back into the fold our mentoring initiative, SU52, and it is in full swing. As you all know, we partnered with the mayor to launch the SU52 initiative early this year, and a team led by Tony Burke has been meeting and organizing for months, and we have now established and continue to add recru a recruitment force that will go out into the community, recruit businesses and mentors to participate in the SU52 mentoring initiative. The recruitment effort is already beginning, but we will kick off officially this October with a goal of adding 200 new businesses as partners in the initiative by the end of this Rotary year, June 30th. Finally, our membership continues to grow and we are laser focused on making sure that our membership makeup does not only reflect our entire community of leaders, but stands out positively for its inclusiveness and attention to the important issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Fellow Rotarians, it is my great privilege to serve as this year's president of Sioux Falls Downtown Rotary Club. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Rotarian Joel Dykstra, who will facilitate today's invocation. Thank you. Please stand with me and bow your heads. Join me in prayer. Our Father, we come to you today and with gratitude, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have to gather here together in person and those who are gathering with us uh, through the live stream. Lord, we just thank you for the uh, leadership of our club and the way that they have led through this difficult time and, and uh, managed to deliver quality through the membership of Rotary. Lord, we thank you that you have allowed us to persevere in this difficult time. And Lord, uh, we thank you for our leaders and our governor and the leaders of our state, um, the leaders in the city of Sioux Falls who have, um, Lord, made those decisions and uh, given us direction. Lord, we just thank you for all of those who you have placed in positions of authority. Lord, we ask you to continue to give them wisdom and discernment as they make the decisions that need to be made in the coming months. Lord, we ask you now to bless our time together. Uh, be with our Rotary Club and all of the families and all of the companies that are represented by our members. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, Joel. The next Rotarian I want to introduce is Rotarian Tony Knorr. Uh, Tony and I happen to be competitors in the business world, but uh, the two of us probably talk more than we do with our own colleagues um, over the last five months. So Tony Knorr, I'd like to introduce you and please come up. Thank you, President Jason, and good afternoon, uh, fellow Rotarians and guests. I um, want to welcome you to the Downtown uh, Rotary Club of Sioux Falls. The moderator of today's discussion is someone we know well, uh, a lifelong journalist and retired media and foundation executive. Jack Marsh is a longtime Rotarian and a former president of our club. Um, he has moderated num numerous candidate debates and other Rotary programs over the last 25 years. Um, he's a co-founder of South Dakota Newswatch, a nonprofit independent news organization dedicated to in-depth coverage of important statewide issues. Jack is actually in the news himself this month, being honored as a 2020 inductee into the South Dakota Hall of Fame. Thank you, Jack, for your willingness to moderate today's conversation. I'd like to welcome uh, South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem. Uh, she is a wife, a mother, a lifelong rancher, farmer, and a small business owner. In 2010, after serving in the South Dakota legislature for, sev legislature for several years, Noam was elected to serve as South Dakota's lone member of the U.S. House of Representatives. In 2018, with the platform of protecting South Dakotans against tax increases, government growth, federal intrusion, government secrecy, uh, she was elected as South Dakota's first ever female governor. As governor, Noam has respected the rights of South Dakotans by trusting them to exercise their personal responsibility to make the best decisions 
for themselves, their loved ones, and in turn, their communities. This approach has been most evident in her response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite her many accomplishments, Governor Noem often shares that her greatest accomplishment is raising her three children, Cassidy, Kennedy, and Booker, with her husband, Byron. All have a deep love for their family and even deeper love uh, for the Lord. I'd ask you right now to join me in, in presenting a warm rotary welcome to South Dakota Governor Christy Noem. It is wonderful to be back in person uh, with the uh, fellow members of Sioux Falls Downtown Rotary. And I wanna give a shout out to the leadership of this club. Uh, so much thought has gone into uh, us coming back in person and doing so safely. And it's a real honor for me to be able to moderate this uh, first program that we've mm -hmm. done in person. Uh, Governor Noem, uh, you and I were talking behind backstage, I, I think, I don't know how many times I have interviewed you or moderated uh, debates that you participated in, but uh, it's we've been doing it, I think, for 10 years now. At least, at least 10 and years. And it, it's yes. always such a privilege. So thank you. Uh, yeah. During these extraordinary times uh, when we're facing challenges that uh, and nobody could have anticipated, thank you yeah. for your willingness to, to, uh, uh, to, to join us today mm -hmm. and to be uh, responsive on a, any number of issues uh, impacting both Sure. our state and our nation. Uh, last Wednesday night, you were the opening speaker at the third night of uh, the Republican National Convention. Mm -hmm. How does that, how did that come to be? <laughs> well, first of all, Jack, let me just give a shout out to Governor Dugard and Linda, because they're here today and they, um, <laughs> I think the world of them, and I just think it's really special they're here. And they certainly set South Dakota up for success for generations. But going back to last Wednesday, I don't really know how it came about other than someone on my team got a phone call um, asking. I know the vice president was the first one who brought it up when I was meeting with some cabinet officials and I had a meeting with the vice president and he said, are you speaking at our convention? And I said, no, not that I'm aware of. And he said to his chief of staff, well, let's make sure uh, that the governor is speaking at the convention. And so it was a couple of weeks after that, that I think somebody on my team got a call, but actually it was his idea, I think at the beginning. And when they called, uh, we said, certainly, I think that uh, an opportunity to, to make sure that we're talking about important issues in this country is is something that South Dakota is appreciative of. So take us through the process of writing uh, you know, a speech that really got national, yeah. even international attention. I mean, do, do, are they all your, bull, all your uh, well, key let me points ask you, or theirs? How, what's, what's the process? Let me ask you first, Jack, did you like the speech? <laughs> if you didn't, it was somebody else's idea. <laughs> No, you know, that's what was funny was because I found out later that a lot of the speakers uh, had hired professional speech writers. Uh, and I have a gal who works with me, Maggie, who, who drafted most of it with me and her talking back and forth. And we just gave it. So that's what I think is kind of interesting about the whole process is there's this whole approach the rest of the country and all the big deals take to making their speeches. And we drafted up what we was thought Maggie, would Maggie be. Maggie Seidel. Maggie Seidel, yeah, she yeah. works for me. But so we the two worked of you worked together. on this together? Yes. So does the Republican National Committee say, well, we want to be sure that you touch on these certain points, or do they give you free Well, rain? they wanted to read it. They definitely they wanted did. to read it. Uh, and then they cut my time. It was originally supposed to be a little longer. And then they said, we've got a lot of speakers. We're going to make it a little shorter. Um, and then they did offer some suggestions. And I said, you know what? It's my time. I'm going to say what I want to say. And um, if you don't want me to use up this time, that's fine as well. But, but the words that I said were all words that I wanted to say. So we didn't use any of the changes that they suggested. So 
this was these were your your beliefs, your thoughts, mm -hmm. and your words in conjunction with you know the, they were uh, with, absolutely with, with Maggie. Well, I want to ask you about two portions of the speech, if mm -hmm. I may. Yes. And I'm I'm reading from the text that was provided. I, I assume you followed mm -hmm. the text that was distributed. Yes. So, uh, so let me just I just want to read this this section, please. America is unique in the world. Government's power at all levels is limited to the confines of our Constitution, which protects our God-given liberties and civil rights. We are not and will not be the subjects of an elite class of so-called experts. Repeat. We are not and will not be the subjects of an elite class of so-called experts. We, the people, are the government. Mm -hmm. Governor, who are these so-called experts uh, who you think should be disregarded? Oh, it does not mean disregarded. It means subject to them. And this is coming specifically back to uh, the conversation we've been having in South Dakota for the last six months, a personal responsibility, that we, the people, as defined by our Constitution, are the government. And ultimately, the responsibility rests with us. Now, there are so-called experts in every field and realm, and I think I've heard from all of them the last six months in weighing decisions on what I had to do in order to protect public health in South Dakota, but also make sure that I was giving people the opportunity to keep their businesses open or a roof over their head and food on their table. And uh, a lot of experts that gave us information, that told us information, some of it was right, a lot of it was wrong. I'd say that all of us would say today that a lot of the modeling that, that everyone was using in the beginning days uh, turned out to be wrong. So who um, of those so-called experts got it wrong? Well, I would say that we've seen uh, different entities change positions all the time. We all know doctors that recommend different things, epidemiologists that recommend different things. Uh, the CDC has changed its position over and over again. The World Health Organization has, and that is natural in when you're dealing with something like a virus. Uh, we're still learning about the virus today. And so what I had told the people of South Dakota over and over again was that um, I was going to learn, study the science, the data, and the facts on the ground and make the best decisions I could to give them the flexibility that they needed. But uh, there are incredible opportunities throughout these last several weeks, but also into the future to continue to let these experts uh, give us their information, their perspectives, but ultimately we are the ones who make the decisions that are important um, for how we want to live our life here in South Dakota. But do you, do, you, do you believe that there are experts in different fields that you should be paying attention to and listening to? I think you should listen to all of them. And I think anybody who knows me uh, knows that I have said for years publicly to people in South Dakota that if there's one thing I want you to remember about me, uh, long after I'm gone and on my ranch with my family, is that I was teachable. You know, that I never dug my heels in and said, I'm absolutely right and I'm never changing positions. That every day I wanna learn more and will reevaluate again. Um, and I think that that is one of the things that, especially in this situation, has been incredibly helpful to make sure that we're making the right decisions. Very good. I want to read another excerpt. It took 244 years to build this great nation, flaws and all, mm -hmm. but we stand to lose it in a tiny fraction of that time if we continue down the path taken by the Democrats and their radical supporters. Mm -hmm. I don't want to I don't want to misinterpret this in any way, so but in the context of this election. Are you suggesting that the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris threatens to destroy this country, this uh, democratic republic as we know it? What I'm suggesting in that section of the speech is that we have leadership in cities across this country that are not upholding the rule of law. And we are seeing chaos and consequences happening to people all over that is absolutely devastating. That is when we stand to lose our country. I also have referenced it several times to what we see when we have leaders that overstep their authority to make decisions 
that they don't have. And when you have a leader overstep their authority in a time of crisis, that's when you break the foundation of this country. So that's why throughout this pandemic, uh, not only did I listen to my state health officials and my state epidemiologist and doctors and talk to experts around the country about what the modeling said, what the science said. I also brought in my constitutional attorneys and I brought in my general counsel and I asked them as governor, what authority do I have? What can I, can I shut down a business? Can I define an essential business? Uh, can I have the ability to issue a shelter in place? And then uh, what authorities do I not have? and then used my, uh, used my decision-making process with all of that input to make sure I was making the right decisions that were for South Dakota. Because if you have a leader that oversteps their authority, especially in shutting down businesses, um, the liabilities you open the taxpayer up to, uh, should you do a taking of that business is substantial. And I wasn't willing to put the taxpayers on the hook for that kind of a decision. Do you believe though that, that the election of a, you know, a Democratic uh, president and vice president would be a threat to our democracy? I think you have an incredible opportunity today to go to these cities and to see the choice we have in this election. And I think that so it is So you think what's important. going on in our cities should be directly tied to how people vote in the presidential election? I think they should ask where they want to raise their children. I don't know of a mother today that wants to raise her children on the streets of Portland. And what is one pattern we're seeing across the country is that these cities that do have Democrat leadership today is where the chaos is happening. And Jack, what you need to recognize about all these situations is that they've rejected federal help, the majority of them. So when the federal government and this administration has wanted to come in and help bring peace back to the streets, these Democratic governors and mayors have rejected that. And so the honest conversation we should be asking ourselves today is what kind of a future do we want? And do we think that when someone breaks the law, because I've always been in favor of peaceful protests, I'm not in favor of the violence I'm watching all the time. I'm not in favor of that. And when someone breaks the law in this country, we believe our laws mean something, the people have agreed to them, and that there should be consequences for that. And, and we all believe we should be treated equally. Regardless of who we are, nobody's above the law. And today we've got very different parameters being used to decide if the laws are gonna be followed or not. You are among the, uh, the president's uh, very loyal allies. Uh, tell us about your relationship uh, with the president, how it, how it has evolved and how it has blossomed over time. You know, I, I don't know. I think we know each other pretty well. Um, the reason that I believe um, and support this president is because of what he has done. Um, I worked extensively on tax reform uh, when I was a member of the House of Representatives and worked with, with his team quite a, quite a bit. And that really showed me their willingness to want to fix things and to get things accomplished. Uh, he's also done more for farmers than any president has in 50 years. Uh, so agriculture is our number one industry here in South Dakota, and everybody knows my whole life has been in agriculture, but the trade agreements that we have negotiated and gotten completed, uh, the ability to come to their aid when they have a disaster situation that's unfolding like we saw here in 2019 over and over again with the flooding that we experienced, uh, what he has done to ensure that our Second Amendment rights are protected, what he has done to get the regulations off of our back that were killing our businesses. Um, when I look at that compared to um, what our other options are, um, you know, for me, that is certainly is the type of viewpoint that I want to support. But I'd say we have a very candid relationship. He knows that I speak truth. Uh, he certainly does <laughs> and gives, shares his perspective. Uh, and we, we don't waste a lot of words when we do have the opportunity to talk. He, I don't think there's been a conversation that he's had with me where he hasn't said, Christy, how can I help you? How can I help South Dakota? And, and that's a wonderful thing to have a president that actually um, wants to help South Dakota. Uh, several of the speakers at last week's convention said that 
They wish that the public could see the president behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. uh, they described him as thoughtful, caring, mm -hmm. empathetic, mm -hmm. not the kind of adjectives that normally uh, uh, you hear associated with, 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 the, with the president. Uh, as you acknowledge, you know the president as well as anybody in this room, mm -hmm. better than anyone mm -hmm. in this room, certainly. Um, what are your observations of the president? Uh, is he caring? Is he thoughtful? Is he empathetic? Uh, and, and what is your assessment of his character? It's not his personality. Mm -hmm. We know his personality. Yeah. What is your assessment of the character of the man? Well, he certainly is caring and thoughtful. He dearly loves his family. I've spent quite a bit of time with him, with his children, and then also with Melania. I, I wish people would get to see how he interacts with Melania. She is his number one advisor, incredibly smart, um, and she has incredible discernment. And almost every time I'm having a discussion with both of them in the room, he will turn to her and say, what do you think of that? Melania, and she will share her thoughts. And I've seen him make decisions based on what she tells him. Uh, so I think that that is a relationship that we haven't gotten to see much in the public, but it is interesting to me to watch how much he honors her and really considers her thoughts and viewpoints on things. Um, I would say that uh, you know, just from when he came to South Dakota on July 3rd, you know, I spent quite a bit of time with him traveling to and from Mount Rushmore and, uh, you know, he made sure that when we landed at Ellsworth Air Force Base, he was going to go over and greet some airmen. He said, Christy, you come with me over here. And I said, no, Mr. President, they want to meet you. Meet you. They want to talk to you. And he said, no, you need to come. These are, these are your guys. And was always making sure that I was walking beside him, that I wasn't behind him, that we were all in a big group taking care of uh, people to make sure no one was left behind. I appreciated that. It showed that he was thoughtful. Well, certainly he's been under attack. Uh, his integrity is uh, under assault. Yeah. Uh, do you do you know a different person? Do you, I mean, do you think Donald Trump uh, is is a person of good character? Do you think <laughs> he's a person of high integrity of principles? I certainly don't think he's perfect. I don't think that any of us are perfect. Uh, but I do think that the intentions that he has in that office are for the best of the country and the people that live here. He does love America. So while he has flaws, absolutely, um, you know, I recognize those. I also recognize that, that I want a leader that wants to do great things, and I want a leader that wants to be in that role for the right reason. The last time I uh, interviewed you or moderated mm -hmm. a debate with you was two year, years ago when you were running for your first term as governor, and I asked you that day, uh, who is your role model in terms of your public service uh, and, and mm -hmm. leadership, and you said, Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. you would call that. Um, where would Donald Trump rank today as a role model for you, for what you believe, for how you act, and uh, for, uh, for how you lead? I don't even think about it. I mean, on, honestly, I, I don't wake up every day and, and try to be somebody else. Um, we, we, I'm just working hard to make sure that I'm doing the right thing for people here. So I guess I, I haven't even thought about using him as a role model, much less that when I look back at the, and maybe that's what we do a lot is we reflect back on people that aren't with us anymore and see what lessons their lives teach us. So um, maybe that's just a process that in the future we'll go through. Uh, millions of Americans cannot find South Dakota on a map. I know. But they now know who is the governor of South Dakota. Um, has your rise to, to this national prominence been intentional or has it just kind of happened? No, I would say it, it definitely just happened. We, we have, um, you know, when I think about the last several months, I, I think about the decisions that I made and how hard those days were. You know, I, I've got a lot of fantastic, amazing people around me helping me. Um, and then I spent hundreds of hours on the phone with other governors across the country talking about what they knew, about what they were going to do, what their team was advising them. I also took a couple of different steps to where I sat on conference calls with 
all the other state epidemiologists in the nation and just listen to their conversations. I don't know. I don't think they even knew I was on the calls. I was the only governor on there, but I wanted to know what were these scientists hearing that us as governors didn't have the opportunity to hear. And then I sat on conference calls with all of the secretaries of health in the country uh, that no other governors were on there too. And, and trying to learn as much as I possibly could and then recognizing that when I was making decisions, it was different. Is it, and it was, is it surprising to you that you now have this national plan? You know, this it is, it is because I think because I made different decisions, it got noticed. And Jack, if you remember, the way it got noticed was incredibly negative. I it was very, it was people attacking me and destroying me and my family and personal attacks on a nationwide basis. And, um, and it was calling me irresponsible and that I was killing people. So that's how the national prominence started was by people who disagreed with me doing everything they could to destroy me. You've been described as a rising star uh, uh, among Republicans. Um, and there certainly is plenty of speculation about what is in your future. Uh, what do you aspire to? What what is the next next what do the next four years look like for you? The next eight years? Uh, will you run for re-election? Would you like to be in the cabinet of uh, second term of of, uh, uh, of President Trump? Uh, give, give us a crystal ball. What's uh, for for Christine well, Ohm? Well, I am uh, hoping you'll allow me to be your governor for the next two years. I'm hoping that you'll let me run for re-election and decide if I did a good enough job. Listen, I worked for two years to campaign, to come back home and be with all of you full time. So obviously this is where I wanna be and where I'm gonna stay. So I don't have any goals of moving on um, because this is really where my heart is, where my family is. And I've, you all know that I'm extremely tied to the land and, and this place. So if I can do what I can do, to follow through on what I promised all of you. I promised you that I would make South Dakota a place you could raise your kids and your grandkids, that there would be higher paying jobs here, that, that I would create new industries, that I believed South Dakota could be an example to the nation. If you guys remember me saying that years ago, um, if we can do that, then, then I will have done my job because when I stood up in those campaigns and talked about it, I believed it and I wanna see that happen. Uh, would you would you tell us what actually took place in the meeting you had with Vice President Pence? Mm -hmm. uh, New York Times had an extensive piece about. Okay, you got a got a ride back with the president. Uh, yeah, that was on Air Force One on, on July third. Uh, New York Times reported that uh, that there was so much speculation within the White House that that you know that you might be aspiring to to join the ticket that you then return to have a conversation to reassure uh, Vice President Pence. What, what actually took place? Oh gosh, we just caught up. So what most people need to remember is that Mike Pence and I served in Congress together. The first two years I got elected, you know, he and was- And you in, knew him well. Yeah, he was time. in the house too. And he was one of my dear friends. So every time I see the Vice President, uh, he says, how come you never come to see me? How come you don't come by? And I said, it's not that easy to get in and out of the White House and go through all the, you're not that easy to see anymore. Um, so, uh, you know, that he had just mentioned that on a phone call, come see me the next time you're in town. So I made an appointment the next time I was in town to go see him. Everything that was in that article that happened in that office uh, did not happen. So it was, and that will be a perfect example again of an article that does not reflect reality. And maybe speculation helps sell newspapers, maybe speculation helps. Uh, someone uh, supposedly in the room said some things that didn't happen. And when I read the article, I called up uh, the chief of staff of the vice president and the vice president expressed my concern because we have been friends. There's never once been a conversation about me replacing Mike Pence on the ticket. The, not with anybody ever has it ever been discussed. So, so the fact so that it was in the news was surprising to me as well. So what was it that prompted you to return to Washington three weeks, I guess the time said three weeks after the 
uh, the July 3rd uh, visit. By the meeting president. with cabinet officials, meeting with uh, folks that were working on policies for South Dakota. I've had extensive. So it was not to ease the anxiety no, of Vice President wasn't. Pence. Not at all. No, sure. we had no anxiety. Uh, we well, are. Good well, friends. let's let's talk about uh, journalists. Let's talk about the news media mm -hmm. then, because you say that New York Times didn't get it right. Mm -hmm. So, and you and I have had this conversation uh, mm -hmm. pre previ previously. How do you evaluate uh, the performance of professional journalists in this country, for that matter, in this state? What do you think is the rightful role of a free and independent press? Uh, uh, give, give us your views. I mean, are you aligned with the, I mean, the, the president is at, at one extreme. Uh, do you, are you aligned with his views of the, of the news media or? Uh, I you know, have just my what, own. What is your perspective? Yeah, I have my own views of the news media. And I would say that um, a free and independent press is hard to find these days. Uh, there are so many times that we give all the facts and information to a reporter and they choose not to use portions of it that doesn't fit the story they want to write. And that is just a fact. Um, we, we have examples of that over and over and over again. So that is what is hard for people like me is that when you see the sensationalizing of a situation that's put into journalism to instill fear in people, I think it's a grave disservice. And Just, we see it more and more often now today than, than I think, I, when I first got elected to Congress, maybe, maybe I just didn't realize it was happening, but especially throughout this pandemic, the way they talked about the Smithfield plant and the way those articles were written uh, shaming me for not shutting down the plant when I had no authority to shoot the, sh shut the plant down. The federal government had deemed it an essential business regardless of anything I would have done, would have had no impact whatsoever on that situation, yet the way those articles were written about me not doing my job and not taking action um, was ridiculous. When I know for a fact those reporters had the facts, had the information before they wrote the stories. Do you and think we have a problem with journalists in South Dakota, or is this a national, more of a national I think issue? we have some phenomenal journalists in South Dakota. I also think we have some that do not do fair reporting. When we put out a great report uh, on, on data or facts, and just certain numbers are picked out um, to write a story, to set an agenda, I don't think that's helpful. For instance, um, on reporting COVID numbers, we constantly have talked about the need to focus on our hospitalization rate. That what's important to us, and back in February and March when we talked about this, we told the public of South Dakota, we are always going to focus on hospitalization, just because we need to take care of people that would get very ill should they catch the virus. And so how many hospital beds do I need to have uh, to take care of those folks that might be exposed and might need an ICU or a hospital bed? Um, when we have a limited number of people in the hospital and we're in a good situation, uh, many times the article will only focus on how many positive cases we have. Or, um, you know, a one story of someone who's having a tragic situation in their life. So I think if you can give all the facts and all the information, families can make better decisions. But when we only report one fact out of 10, then it skews really what the viewpoint is and that that's not helpful, especially when you're in the middle of a crisis. But you, you say that there are some journalists who you think are mm -hmm. doing a, a good job, correct? Mm -hmm. So who, who are some of the journalists you respect, whether it's here in South Dakota or nationally? Oh, I think you should tell me all the politicians you respect too. <laughs> Let's go through that list. <laughs> I thought I was asking the question. <laughs> I mean, do you, I mean, do you think there are, you know, do you really have res deep respect oh. for certain journalists that you'd, you'd like to give a shout out to them? Oh gosh, Jack, I'm, I'm not going to start down that path because no matter what, I'll forget somebody or I'll mention somebody you'll <laughs> find a flaw in, but um, I do think Well, how about on your naughty list? Do you have anybody on, on your my naughty, naughty list? list? You want to tell We'll let that be for now. Very good. So what do you think journalists can do? Uh, how, how can journalists do a better job, specifically here in South Dakota? And you, 
shortly after you were elected, you addressed a room of South Dakota uh, newspaper editors and publishers, and you said you said to them very sincerely, uh, "Hold me accountable." Uh -huh. uh, what do you think? What do you, what do you think is the obligation of professional journalists in South Dakota to do just that? That if they have the information, they should they should use it. Um, and when they reach out to us, give us more than two minutes. We actually had one article that we got an email from a reporter asking for information on a story, and their story was posted, I think, less than a minute later. So their story was already written, and they wanted to write in there that they had reached out to the governor's office. So they sent the email, and a minute later, the, the story was posted. That kind of stuff is garbage. And enough is enough, because that's just, in South Dakota, I think we're better than that. But that happens to us on a daily basis. So when you guys read the governor's office didn't respond with comment or didn't, there may be, I'm not saying that we always get to every single one, but, but in some of those situations, it was something like that. The other thing, Jack, I would tell you, because uh, our, our good friend Kevin Wooster has said this before, um, I don't really think I know Christy well enough yet. Well, gosh, Kevin. That's Wooster, what Kevin said? Yeah, I mean, he'll, he'll say that to my staff once in a while. and. You know, I don't know if that's necessarily all my fault. I think that a lot of reporters um, want to be able to write what they want to write and don't really take time to get to know me either. I've pretty much been an open book for over 10 years in South Dakota. I've opened up my home to reporters. I've, I've put all my family out there. I've put more stuff on social media about my personal life than any governor ever has in the state before. I mean, we are, you guys know what you're getting when you get the Gnome family. And so I've tried very hard to let people know me. And if reporters feel like they don't know me very well or what's going on in my head or what I, the way that I think, the way I make decisions, that may not always necessarily be my fault. When you uh, were running for governor two years ago, uh, the state was still reeling over two major yes. scandals, the EB-5 scandal, the Gear Up scandal. And you came out with a transparency platform, you called mm -hmm. it the Sunshine Initiative, mm -hmm. and uh, I know very early in, uh, as governor, you got the Reporter's Shield Law mm -hmm. passed, yep. which was uh, quite extraordinary, I thought, but because it had been talked about for a long time, yeah. and you got it through right away. But tell, give us a progress report on how the state is doing in being more open, more transparent, and what work is yet to be done. Yeah, we're consistently working to put more information online at open.sd.gov to get the state's checkbook out there so you can see actually where the dollars are going and then make it easier to get it to be accessible. I think that's what we heard from a lot of folks was it's hard to find the information that we're looking for. So to make all the websites stream through each other so that you can access that more uh, clearly. So we're continuing to do that. And then I think, Jack, you know, certainly in the last six months, we've had a lot of things on our plate, but we had over 60 press conferences in I think 45 days, 45 to 50 days. So I think just the availability we've tried to make ourselves open to. With and the to COVID briefings? Yes, and communicate with people. Um, it's been an incredible two years so far. If you remember 2019, um, over 60 of our counties were declared federal disaster areas from flooding some counties five times over in one calendar year and then to immediately be hit with a pandemic as well. It's been very important to us that we are open and transparent so people know what we're doing. Shift to uh, COVID and the COVID response. Uh, uh, these infection, uh, infection control measures, uh, masking, social distancing. Um, what is the science that you are following? What is the science you believe in what are your recommendations for individuals and what is the example you follow in practicing social distancing? Well, in social distancing, if people that have a vulnerable condition, so if they're older or the things that, one of the conditions that would make them more susceptible to be getting very sick, we're continuing to recommend that those folks stay home when possible. Um, you know, we have, um, they're called comorbidities. Correct. But if people have those types of conditions, they should be careful where they're at because if they catch this virus, they could end up in the hospital. 
And so continuing to encourage people to do that, to make sure that they're staying home. I know a lot of folks are still um, not shaking hands, doing things like that, but recommending people wash their hands often and be safe and participate in those recommendations is incredibly important. What, do you, which, what, what does the science tell you about masks? I think the science is very mixed on masks. We know that some masks could be effective. Uh, from most of the researchers and doctors I've talked to, the most effective mask would be an N95 mask where you change the filter every four hours. Uh, there's, there's also science that says a lot of what the people are wearing today is not effective. Um, and especially if they're wearing them improperly, especially if they're touching them, taking them off and uh, not laundering them and taking good care of how they're keeping them sanitized. So it's, that's why you've seen me consistent, consistently recommend that people make their own decisions. If they, if they want to wear a mask, I think they should be able to do that. If they also choose not to, um, I think that that is up to that family as well to decide. The CDC, uh, uh, certainly the World Health Organization, uh, the American Medical Association, uh, Dr. Burks, Dr. Fauci, the Mayo Clinic, uh, Sanford Health, Avera Health, all consistent in recommending the wearing of masks for anyone two years and older. I would you, say you that, challenge that, that I do challenge what you just said because it has not been consistent at all from all those organizations. Uh, but that CD, is the, the CDC that is the, has that, changed their recommendation over and over again. But that uh, is the current guideline. Yeah, well, it could be the current guideline. And that's why we say to people, our Department of Health tells people to watch CDC guidelines and that make the decisions that work best for themselves. But have you seen other science that would challenge that? Oh, absolutely. There's all kinds of studies out there and people are using um, specific examples that aren't backed up by peer-reviewed studies. That's the one thing you should consistently look at when you're looking at the data behind how you're making a decision. Is it peer-reviewed? Was it conducted in a controlled setting to where you really do have reliable data? Um, you know, that's why it has been so mixed and why it's, I believe, a controversial decision. But I would hope that we could all respect everybody's decision to make the one that is right for them. Uh, we are in, uh, in the midst of a, of a COVID surge. Uh, I've got numbers here that were reported yesterday, and, and you may have more up-to-date up numbers, but uh, South Dakota, has, uh, as of yesterday, it set a new single-day record in new uh, coronavirus cases, th uh, 380 yesterday. Uh, we had re no additional deaths. And I know uh, you've always said that the number you watch is hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. We've actually seen a drop in hospitalizations, but but nonetheless, we are seeing a surge in active cases mm -hmm. around the state, uh, now in Pennington County, in Brookings County, in Clay County, uh, in Minnehaha, certainly. Uh, uh, is this, is, you know, what, what concerns do you have about this surge that we're, this, this new surge we're seeing, and what are, you, what are you projecting out? What's causing this? Well, we are certainly tracking uh, all the data that we've been tracking for months. And if you remember, Jack, I think back in March, I was telling you that there could be days I stand up in front of South Dakota and be announcing thousands of new positive cases of COVID-19. I mean, that was what they were predicting for us. So, Based on modeling at that time. Right, right. And so we're not, uh, I don't think any of this is a surprise because for the last several months I've told people that we will get more cases. We know for a fact we can't stop the virus. Now we can slow it down and bend our curve, which is what we did, but that we were always going to focus on that hospitalization rate. So we're in a good position for that today. I think they told me originally based on modeling my peak day in June, I would have up to 10,000 people in the hospital in South Dakota that would have COVID-19. Today we have 76. So I think what our healthcare systems did was incredible and, and how they came together to help us prepare and plan and take care of people has been extremely helpful. I do think that we're continuing to watch every county and our Department of Health works with every business, every hotspot that might come about. Some of this, I believe, is probably due to people being back in college, back in school, going back to some normal activities. Although in South Dakota, we've been 
back to normal largely for almost four months now. So I think it's a testimony to you can continue to live and uh, slow down the spread of the virus. And what is encouraging about some of those positive cases is that they're younger people, uh, that they're people that will recover and have very few symptoms and do very well. What happens is when people have another health condition, that's a problem. And thank goodness we've had, um, you know, fairly good luck protecting that vulnerable population. You've always said this is a marathon, not a, sp not a sprint. Right. Uh, you also said uh, uh, have said that we need to remain uh, nimble and flexible. Mm -hmm. This surge that we're, we've seen here in the last uh, 10 days, two weeks, uh, is this a time that we need to, to change our recommendations to the people of South Dakota, whether it's with masking or social distancing or any other aspect? Is this a, is this a time for a pivot? I won't be changing my recommendations that I can see in the next, uh, in the near future. I think that um, this is uh, where we expected we would be. Uh, none of this is a surprise. Uh, and we'll continue to reevaluate though and, and see what the future looks like. Do you think that uh, local school officials, local government officials should have the latitude to impose mandates if they cho choose or impose uh, shutdowns or any social distancing uh, 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 limitations? Well, I have given each of our school administrators the flexibility that they need to make a plan work for their district. You know, some of our districts have very different buildings, very different facilities, even their staff population is incredibly different. So if you've seen what's happened throughout the state, some schools are back full time. Some schools are back full time, but they've got their kids isolated to one or two classrooms and keep them separated from the rest of the population. Some are back part time, three days a week. And, and then we're giving every parent the opportunity to have their child learn uh, by virtual uh, or distance learning methods. But this is what I want people to know, that my heart is and my desire is that these kids be back in their school buildings. And the reason that I want that is because we lost track, Jack, of 30% of our kids in the state. I mean, they did not check in once we called off school last spring. And that means that those children, even though administrators and teachers were reaching out to them, they didn't have a support system at home that said, you need to be doing some homework, you need to be following through on this. They maybe didn't have parents at home that were being responsible for them. The vast majority of these kids are, are kids that live in poverty or um, that we think could be vulnerable to neglect or have a situation that's not safe at home. And that's why we hate this about our society today, that that's the role the school plays, but they really do. They are the ones that see these kids walk in the door and say, hey, something might not be going right at home. And so that 30% of those children that I know is my population that needs some extra support, if I can't see them for months on end, I don't know how they're doing. And, and we also know for all the other children, they only learned about 50% of the math that they would have normally learned had they been in the classroom. They through only, remote learning. Through remote learning. We know that they only learned about 70% of the accomplishments that they could have achieved in reading. So we know it is harming them. And if we can bring some of that back in a way that's safe and give our school districts the flexibility to do it in a way that works for them, uh, that is something I would like to see happen in every school district and, and keep continuing forward. Uh, the federal government, and correct me if I've got the figures mm -hmm. uh, wrong here, but I, I believe through the CARES Act, the federal government has allocated $1.25 mm -hmm. billion dollars to the state of South Dakota. Yes. And I believe there is about $900 million mm -hmm. that still is yet to be allocated, and you have until December 31st <laughs> to decide that. Do I have yes, that correct? Yes, that is true today. Okay. I've been asking for more flexibility on that deadline. Okay. Uh, Speaker of the House Stephen Haugard yep. is asking for a special session of the legislature. Uh -huh. His position is that the legislature should be able to weigh in on how uh, at least a mm -hmm. portion of those that $900 million is spent. Do you, agree, do you agree the legislature should be allowed to weigh in? And will you call a special session of the legislature? Yes, I do believe they should be able to weigh in and they have been. We have been having meetings and phone calls and conference calls, all of which the speaker's been a part of on their ideas on how they believe this money should be spent. 
I'm also a big believer that if we're going to be making these decisions, I would prefer it happens during a normal session because it, during a normal legislative session, we have committee hearings. So you can bring people in and have them testify on their specific industry, how they were impacted, and if we should have a program that would bring them aid through these dollars. We can have debate on the House floor and on the Senate floor to make sure that we're appropriately spending this money and do it in a way that gives us more time to make a wise decision. Does if the federal government give you that flexibility? Well, that's what we're asking for. And if we don't, then we will make sure that we have a plan coming forward where the legislature will be a part of making sure that we know where it goes and how it gets spent and that it's the right place. But it, what would happen is the language would have to change in a federal bill. So if Congress did another stimulus package, which they told me they was coming within the next couple of weeks, that's where that language on giving us more flexibility to wait until 2021 to spend it and would be helpful because we're still going to be dealing with this virus all of next year. It's not gonna be over as soon as we get to the end of the year. So to give states the ability to have more time to make sure we're making better decisions and that I don't want to have to spend all that money in December and then have the state of South Dakota incur a bunch of costs next March and April that now we don't have any resources for. So just to clarify, you're saying you hope the federal government gives you the flexibility to, to allow a regular session of the state legislature deal with this. Yes. But if you are not given that flexibility, you would call a special session between now and the end of the I, year? We, we, we anticipate that that certainly is something that we would consider doing. Um, the other thing that I think is important for everybody to know is that I'm the one who gets audited on how this money gets spent. So the language in the bill that was passed through Congress gave the authority to the governor to spend the money and they will hold us accountable to how it gets spent. So the legislature, we are incorporating and taking in all of their information. I want to have bills and debates so they can give direction on where it goes. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if it's not spent appropriately, I'm the one who's on the hook. What about the fiscal health of uh, our state, mm -hmm. uh, state government? Uh, I know we we closed out the fiscal year with a su slight surplus, as, as I recall. We did. Well, that, and that was because we made adjustments as soon as the virus hit. As soon as the virus hit, we tightened our belts and, and uh, had the agencies um, stop spending on areas that they could, and we ended with a $19 million surplus, which okay. I don't believe, I haven't heard of another state that ended their fiscal year with a surplus. And, and the, as I understand it, the revenues that you saw in July including sales tax, mm -hmm. are up year yes. over year? Yes. What is going on? Well, I think that there's areas that are down and that are concerning. So there's a couple of things. There was quite a bit of federal money that came into South Dakota. And so that has been spent and that has kept elevated numbers higher. We still anticipate that in three or four months, we could see those start to decline. But I think one of the other areas and reasons why we did better was because we didn't shut down businesses and we didn't um, you know, force people to really harm their livelihoods long term. We gave them some flexibility. Now, people were still dramatically impacted, but I think we did a little bit better than other states in that. And honestly, our second largest industry is tourism. And it seems like everybody in the country wants to visit South Dakota right now. I mean, we have, our tourism is way above last year and people are coming and have been for months um, and enjoying a little bit of freedom. Uh, what about the economic recovery for the state? How are we doing on uh, unemployment? How are we doing on, on you know, business recovery? Uh, well, the numbers always lag a little bit, so I wish I could give you up-to-date information, but the latest, even back in June, our job recovery was at 80%, which is phenomenal, considering that when the president stood up on national TV and told everybody to stay home for 15 days. Largely people in South Dakota stayed home. Um, and so we did have some job losses and we were already 80% back. Um, our unemployment has recovered. Um, some we're at 6.3, I believe right now um, for the data that we have, but uh, we're doing better than virtually almost every other state, but it's not good enough yet. I believe we can do better get more people off of the reemployment um, assistance that they're on and get them into positions. We're also recruiting a lot of businesses. So what I'm excited about is that people will have options. 
uh, you ran on a platform to improve tribal relations mm -hmm. uh, between the state and our, uh, our nine uh, federally recognized tribes. Uh, we now have the stalemate going on, or mm -hmm. uh, I characterize it, between uh, some of the tribes and your office yeah. over the uh, checkpoints or roadblocks mm -hmm. on state and federal highways going across the reservations. Uh, how is this going to be resolved? Well, you know, honestly, Jack, this is not my area of authority. And, and that's what's surprising to me about the whole situation is that our tribes have a couple of them, not all of them, just a couple have put up some checkpoints stopping people from going on the reservation. So Pine Ridge, Rosebud, and Cheyenne, Cheyenne River. Yep. And, and not all of them are still in place. Um, I'd say Cheyenne River is probably the one that has been the most aggressive. And, uh, but they don't have the jurisdiction to set up the checkpoints where they've set them up. Um, and I don't have the authority to stop them. It is the federal government that has the authority over federal highways. So is this a going tribal, through... tribal sovereignty issue? Uh, I think that they have all the authority in the world to put up checkpoints on their BIA roads. And, and we have told them that we would help them facilitate that. The problem is, is that they're breaking the law and it's impacting people's day-to-day -day lives in those areas. There are people that have property and animals on the reservation that can't get access to them because they can't Do you believe that they're turning people away? Yes, I know they are because I had hundreds of complaints coming from these checkpoints and I asked our federal delegation and the Department of Justice to resolve it because as a state, I don't have any authority in this issue. It was not getting resolved and more and more people were complaining to my office. So the attorney general did an investigation and sent officers up there and we have a video and signed affidavits of what is happening at these checkpoints and what is happening is illegal activity. So we have told all these chairmen and uh, visited with all of them and Chairman Frazier of Cheyenne River has my cell phone number and we um, used to talk all the time, not so much lately, but, uh, that we will help them come to a solution. The Department of Interior has been uh, working as well to keep the conversations going, but there has been no resolution yet. My concern is, is that we do have uh, laws being broken. We do have people that are being harmed by it. And that if we could find a solution to where they could operate their checkpoints on BIA roads, that would be the best case scenario for everyone to resolve it. Uh, major national discussion going on right now about the integrity of this election coming mm -hmm. up because of primarily mail-in ballots in South Dakota. The sec our Secretary of State has 100,000 requests for for mail-in ballots. Uh, are you do you have any concern about the integrity of the upcoming election in South Dakota? You know, I haven't had a discussion with Steve Barnett about what um, this looks like for his office and his ability to administer it. I would say that nationwide, I've heard some stories that are a little scary. I talked to somebody the other day that received six ballots to their home. In South Dakota? No, not in South Dakota. So I, I can't speak to South Dakota. Okay. The stories that I've heard that are concerning are the ones out of in other states. But you have no examples or evidence I don't of have the problems any, here? No, with I voter don't. fraud, potential no. voter fraud. Uh, two ballot issues uh, we have coming up. Uh, involving marijuana. One would uh, legalize medical use of marijuana. The other would be a constitutional amendment legalizing the recreational use and sale of marijuana in the state. Uh, wh what's your position on those two ballot issues? I'm against them both. Any flexibility? On, Not on either uh, of them. I, I honestly, I've never met anybody who got smarter after they smoked marijuana, Jack. So I just think that uh, we have some derivatives that are available, FDA approved to treat medical conditions that people can utilize as well. And what I have told people for years is if the FDA approves medical marijuana for use in, in medical situations, then absolutely, I think that's something we should consider. But the way that these ballot measures are going about it, um, I don't think it's the right thing for South Dakota. And I also, as far as recreational use. I've seen the consequences of that in other states, and I sure don't want to see it here for our kids. Uh, relatively low teacher pay was a major issue when, uh, when uh, Governor Dugard was in office. Uh, we passed a half penny sales tax to try to raise the, the pay of our educators. 
uh, you, you know, I, I know that the, the, I believe the legislation calls for that to be eventually uh, phased out. How are we doing, do you feel, in, in raising teacher pay relative to other states? And do you still see us phasing out that half penny sales tax? Well, I have uh, always felt that we could do a better job um, rewarding teachers and recognizing that, especially those teachers that are consistently going above and beyond. So I don't think we're where we need to go yet as far as teacher salaries. Um, but I also believe that, that we have an incredible opportunity to make sure that, that we're doing that in the right way. So do you think that that half penny sales tax should be sunsetted? You know, point? I that's a debate the legislature's had every year so far that half penny sales tax um, isn't going away. I don't think that it will be a discussion this year in the legislature. Um, but, you know, obviously you've been around a long time, too. You know that I don't control what bills come forward and which ones don't. There's a lot of bills that get filed. President Trump, uh, in his acceptance speech uh, for the nomination last week, brought up school choice. Mm -hmm. And the education secretary, Betsy uh, DeVos, has had a lot to say about school mm -hmm. choice, whether it be with charter schools, vouchers, or some other way that you know, uh, public funds are used to support privately run uh, schools. It, do you believe that school choice is something that should be we should proceed with in South Dakota? I think it's something that we have to continue to look at as a possibility. We have, look at what we're doing down on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation now with a new type of education system that's going to give kids a real choice to get a real education that didn't even have that opportunity before. So that was, you know, a bill that we debated in the legislature last year. We're going to continue to pursue uh, because I think that those children that have no options should have a better option. And I'm specifically looking at those targeted regions, um, especially where our tribal areas are, where these kids deserve better. Is there a downside to going with school choice? No, I think there, the people that are, uh, you know, affiliated and supportive of the public school system are worried about it draining funds away, you know, and that's a debate that, that we'll have. Um, but I also think that I, I've always been in favor of giving parents options and that this discussion you know is something that's been going on in South Dakota for years um, and and we'll continue to do that I think that when we do have a solution come forward it would be something that everyone would recognize as a win for the student you announced uh, last week that you're uh, you would like to see a merger of the Department of Agriculture mm -hmm. and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources and it would be uh, run uh, by Secretary Hunter Roberts. What, what, what's the argument for merging those two departments? And, and could there be a conflict? Because sometimes environmental issues uh, are uh, in, in conflict with, uh, with, with ag issues, I think in terms of you know, CAFOs, I think oh, in terms of, 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 our, of our waterways, 80% uh, of our waterways in South Dakota are, have major deficiencies. So, just talk about that proposed merger. Well, the, some of the best stewards of our land are farmers and ranchers. I mean, they're going to pass this on to their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. So they're very interested in keeping it as pristine as it is today. Um, but both of these agencies are largely regulatory agencies. Um, Agriculture is our number one industry in the state. And if we can streamline and make state government more efficient, I think that's a really good thing. Um, and also within agriculture um, and the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, there's all kinds of checks and balances and partnerships with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and other requirements that are in place and federal government requirements that make sure that we are doing due diligence in, in protecting the environment while we're producing on our land and making sure uh, that we're facilitating the ag industry. So I think this is an incredible opportunity for us to streamline those agencies um, and make sure that they're partnering better in a way that, um, you know, they do well today, but, but to be um, efficient and have the same expertise in the building coming up with solutions would be very helpful. You've been in office uh, almost uh, two years mm -hmm. as our governor. What have been the toughest aspects for you of being gov governor? What have been the greatest surprises? Well, I, I think we've just faced a situation uh, the last six months that I couldn't call up Governor Dugard and say, what did you do during the last pandemic? 
you know, that was a little bit of a different situation. There wasn't. He was not in office in, in 1918. <laughs> no, he wasn't. So that was that was a little bit of a tough challenge to not necessarily have uh, someone who had gone through the situation right. before that you could call up and get some advice from. Um, and and that maybe also I was used to in Congress um, and in farming. I, I was in partnership with my brothers and sister and my mom. Uh, in all my businesses, I had people that were in it with me as governor. Um, largely, I had people that worked for me, gave me fantastic advice, but I had to decide. So uh, I've referenced it a couple times before in other interviews that it got pretty lonely sometimes. You know, we would have these heated um, debates and discussions. I'd have half my team on one side of an issue, half my team on the other side, and then they'd say, well, I guess you just have to decide. And I'd say, okay, give me an hour. And then I would have to go decide it. The best part of that was, and I, I apologize to my son Booker for this all the time, because, you know, what he, I got elected to Congress, I think when he was eight years old. So I spent a lot of his growing up years being gone. When we were, when I was home on the weekends, we had a family rule that everybody had to be together and whatever I was doing, the whole family had to come. But I missed a lot of his growing up years. Um, when this pandemic hit, he came to peer and just was with me all the time. And so what, what hijacked his senior year and all of his stuff got called out for me was the biggest blessing I could have ever had because he sat right by my desk for 18 hours a day. And when I would get off one of those phone calls, he would look at me and he would say, mom, let's go shoot baskets for 10 minutes. And we would go outside and shoot baskets for 10 minutes. Or he'd say, let's go play a game of mitt full quick, and then you can come back and decide. But, you know, he, he, it was just, while it was one of the toughest things, uh, and I also was able to find and get some perspective on what is it all about. And it's about our families. And hopefully every family in the state had an opportunity to spend a little extra time together. One last question. Uh these are very difficult times in this country. Mm -hmm. um, what do you feel it, it will take to calm and heal this splintered uh, society, to, to unify our nation, to unify our, our state, uh, rededicate ourselves to a well-functioning democracy, mm -hmm. to truth, to civility, to, uh, to peace, to justice? Big, big question, but a serious one because uh, it's very troubling what's going yeah. on right now. Yeah, it is. So I, I believe there is um, a unique opportunity coming that we feel like we're breaking right now and maybe we are reaching a low point that we haven't seen in decades. But from that, my hope is that we find a way to heal in a way that we haven't before. So my choice is to focus on what opportunity we might have. There is real consequences to how we talk to each other in this country. And I think we're seeing that every day. Um, and we also are a country that's addicted to being offended. We love to be offended. Everything somebody says, we pick up that offense and we carry it around with us everywhere we go. But then we're the ones walking around with a burden. So what I would encourage everybody to do is to just choose not to be offended by everything. Try to give people a little bit of grace and recognize that maybe they're going through something you have no idea that they're dealing with. And then when we, when we get through this and we try to operate in grace, that there will be a revelation of who we really are as a country and as a people. And that my hope is that we'll be better. We'll be much better than we've been in a long time. And that's, that's what my hope is when I get up in the morning. South Dakota Governor Christy Nome, yeah. thank, thank you so much thanks, Jack. for joining you us bet. today. You bet. Well, if we, there's anything we've learned today or we're reminded of is leadership is hard. And we want to thank the governor for her leadership um, over the last two years. Thank you, Governor. One more. In the past, we used in the past we used to give mugs, rotary mugs, to our uh, our speakers. 
Um, but today, instead, we have a book um, that I think the elementary students at Hawthorne would love to appreciate to see your signature or message to them. So thank you, Governor. We will convene again in person on September 24th. More information will be shared in the coming days. Thank you for joining us today. Meeting is adjourned. Uh -huh.